It's been bouncing around for weeks. Oh, okay. Welcome, guys, to the episode 32 of Edu All Stars. My name is Todd Nesloni. Um, thank you for being here tonight. You can find me on Twitter at Tech Ninja Todd, my co host. And I am Chris Kessler. You can find me on Twitter at I am Kessler. And we are very excited today to have Tony Sinanis, who is currently in his sixth year as the lead learner of. Cantiagua? Sure, sure. We can call it that. <laughs> uh, it's uh, actually Caniag. Um, Caniag. Oh, I'm sorry. We Elementary we... in um, Jericho, New York. Yes. Uh, he was na- uh, the school was named a 2012 National Blue Ribbon School, mm-hmm. and Tony recently received the 2013 Bammy Award for Elementary School Principal of the Year. So yeah. thanks, Tony, for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. No, no problem. I squeeze you right in between, you know, prime time and Jimmy Kimmel. They're interviewing you later. So it's all good. No worries. Hey, well, uh, that's how that's as long as when you go on Jimmy Kimmel, you mention your Edu All Stars interview. Hello, Tech Ninja Todd. You are like the man. Like, didn't you go to the White House? You met like the president. I did nothing. What are you talking about? Hey, Jimmy Kimmel is about as cool as the president. I think so. I think that's maybe. a good point. That's a very good point. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> Well, you know, Tony, one of the first things we kind of like to ask our guests is just to get a little bit of background of how they ended up in the education field. So what was your journey? Okay. So, well, I, um, I went to, to college uh, to be a doctor. I actually was in a pre-med program. Um, and and uh, after about six months, it was clear that I was not meant to be a doctor, uh, mainly because uh, <laughs> it requires passing science classes. And uh, <laughs> that was not my area of uh, expertise. So um, I, I shifted gears. And... Um, I, I, I did several things. I had, I think, about uh, six majors uh, between uh, that one and actually deciding on education. So um, the, the shift for me happened when, as part of our um, sort of degree at Union College. I started at Union College. It was at, is in upstate New York. Uh, great school, great small liberal arts school. But part of our um, studies required that we did some sort of community service. So I did uh, tutoring to uh, at an after school program with uh, like upper elementary and middle school kids. And we did that every week and it slowly became the highlight of my week, you know. And uh, what I looked forward to, what I got excited about um, and working with these kids definitely changed my thinking about what I wanted to do. So after majoring in theater, psychology, English and a couple of other things, I uh, decided on elementary education, and I actually transferred to NYU because the program I wanted to pursue, they didn't have a union, so I transferred mm-hmm. and uh, graduated from there, and it was definitely the best decision I've ever made in terms of, of fulfilling my professional sort of dream. I love it. It's like the best job ever. Cool. So how many years did you teach in the classroom? So I taught for eight years. I was uh, I, t- I started in New York City, so I, like, it was one of those crazy things. Like I got my job three days before the school year started. Right, <laughs> they <laughs> went into like this open like cattle call of like we need teachers. So everyone and their mother was there, um, and uh, I went on a bunch of interviews. And I sat with this one assistant principal, and you know we talked. And then he offered me a job on the spot. And not only did he offer me a job, but he was like, "Do you want to be the writing teacher?" K through five, or do you want to be a fifth grade teacher? So there was this thing about having a class. I wanted my own kids, all that stuff. So I was like, yeah, definitely the fifth grade teacher. So um, I accepted the job. I didn't, you know, didn't have time to think about it. Didn't have time to talk about it with anyone because he was like, yeah, I need to know in like five minutes because they're wrapping <laughs> up the job fair. I was like, okay. So um, I taught for I taught for three years in New York City, but my first job was amazing. I had thirty seven fifth graders in my first class, and um, I had desks for maybe about twenty of them. Um, and so we in, we innovated. We we innovated at a time where innovation wasn't even cool because we figured out how to squeeze everyone into the room and we used the rug, the windowsill. My desk became a spot, whatever, whatever space we had in the room uh, became a place to learn. So um, it was great. I did that for two years in that school and then I taught for a year in, in Manhattan. Uh, I taught fourth grade and then I moved out to Long Island uh, in Hewlett where I also taught fifth grade for five years. So it was a total of eight years. Uh, teaching mostly fourth and fifth grade. Yeah. So there comes a, a time in a lot of teachers' career where they have to make a decision on whether they want to stay in the classroom or do something else related uh, to the campus. When did you decide you were ready to move kind of into the administrative role? So, so I did my um, I did my first master's in educational technology um, at a local like tech school in uh, on Long Island. And when I was done, one of the professors she kind of like cornered me one day and she said, you know, I really think you need to consider at least getting an administrative degree, um, if for nothing else, it kind of gives you that global perspective on the school and how it runs and 
all that stuff. And, and, and it just makes you more marketable if you ever want to pursue it. So I did. It was relatively cheap. Um, they let me teach a class as well, so it made it even cheaper. So I, I, I did it. I had it. I had the degree for a couple of years. And uh, then our son was born. And um, so he had some medical issues at birth, which just kind of like threw us for a loop a little bit and uh, totally introduced a, a new normal for us. Um, but what started to happen was, um, I don't know, I, I thought that because he was around and I, for the first time in my life, understood like unconditional love and this other sure. human being like becomes your everything, right? I was like, oh, I don't know if I could be a classroom teacher anymore because those kids are my life and I devote so much of everything to them. That is it even possible to split this? You know, is it even possible to manage both of these things? So it was more like a, a fear kind of thing. Like I don't think I could be as good as I was because of this little man, you know. Um, so I started going on interviews and I got offered an assistant principal position at an elementary school uh, that was close by, even closer to home than my than my teaching position was. And I figured if there was a time to make the jump, that was the time and and see what happens, you know. Um, and so that's what it was about eight years in, and um, it was really that sort of thing about whether or not I could actually split myself between family and, and school. But but I was wrong, by the way, because being the principal requires a whole lot more than being the teacher sometimes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you started off in, as an AP and then moved your way into principalship, and, is that, yes. that's, and that's where you're at now? That's where I'm at. Yeah, I was an assistant okay. principal for one year. Um, I can just say to anyone out there who's considering administration, if you get an assistant principal position, do not rush out of the assistant principal position because mm -hmm. it is a wonderful thing to be able to pass the buck to someone else. <laughs> uh, it is a wonderful thing to be the person that's, a, I don't know, you know, that's what the principal said. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a whole different thing and I, and I only did it for one year and um, I, mean, I love being a principal but there's something really special about being an assistant principal that I wish I had done a little bit longer. Yeah, right. that's great. And that's great knowledge. I'm going through a master's program right now and that's a... Uh, it's timely for sure. It is. It's a humbling thing, right? Because you, you know, you always feel like you know better. Like I could do this differently. I could do this, you know. And and my principal was amazing, but and that it was just a really wonderful learning opportunity to be in an mm -hmm. assistant principal position, and I, I could have learned a lot more. So, cool. very cool. Well, you're also someone who has chosen to connect yourself via social media. How yeah. did that come about when you wanted to make that leap? So initially our district was pushing Twitter on us as a way to communicate with parents and, and mainly just like upcoming events kind of stuff, you know, or activities and, and so on and so forth. So I was totally resistant. I didn't like it. I didn't like the idea of it. Um, you know, Twitter had this whole sort of negative, in my mind, connotation is, uh, you know, a place where you, I don't know, I don't really care what Britney Spears is doing and I don't really want to know what Nicki Minaj is eating for dinner or, you know, whatever. So it, it, in my mind that's what it was, right, and cyberbullying and all this stuff. So I wanted to kind of stay away from it. Uh, I resisted at first. They let go of it. They didn't force us to do it. And then I read the article about Eric in uh, School Administrator, uh, I think in like December of 2011 or, or January 2012. I don't remember exactly when it was. Uh, I read about this sort of group of educators that were using Twitter to connect, to share, to learn, to, to, to curate information, to professionally develop themselves, and all these really amazing things at their fingertips, you know, on their phone or on their iPad or on their desktop. And it just was a no-brainer, at least to explore it, you know. Um, and so I did. And uh, here I am two years later. And it has actually now become the focus of my dissertation. Uh, I'm in the middle of doing my doctoral uh, studies at University of Pennsylvania. And for my dissertation, I am studying or exploring I have to get the question right because there's a whole thing about this. Um, I'm <laughs> exploring the relationship between active participation on Twitter and the professional development of principals. So, so it's led to a lot. You know, it's led to a lot of things. It's been an amazing journey, and um, you know, and all it took was reading about Eric Scheminger and 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 seeing how he was using it and how other educators were using it to kind of demystify all the um, you know the, the stuff that was out there that I didn't really understand. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm very glad I took the leap and and got connected. Yeah, for sure. You know, you, you know, we don't talk to anyone that says, "Eh, Twitter's overrated." You know, <laughs> everyone loves it. It's, like, it's amazing. Once you once you figure it out and you get past yes. that little kind of learning curve right up front, right? Like, you're just like, "La!" Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. You have an epiphany, right? Like the light right, exactly you know, comes down, <laughs> right. the halo and the angel wings. No, it's crazy, and you don't know that because right? initially it's it's kind of humbling, right? Because if you you know until you develop your PLN and you start to connect with people, you're 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 putting 
I don't know, random tweets out there, no one's responding. And initially, right. I was like, what, what the heck is this? I'm not wasting my time with this crap. You know, so it, it, it initially is a turnoff. And I see for people who go to like training sessions or workshops or whatever, that they, the majority of people get turned off because there isn't that instantaneous sort of, you know, connection or, or oh, I'm just going to put it on Twitter and get it. It takes time. It's a journey, right? And so yeah. you have to recognize that that's, that's how this plays out. Yeah, I had a cool little thing happen today. We were, we were in a professional development for this new software that we got called Safari Montage. And so right when the right when the session started, I just tweeted out, "Hey, you guys, anyone ever heard of you know Safari Montage?" Just on my PLN, and a couple people started responding back. And one girl ends up saying, "Yeah, it's pretty good, but I really like Discovery Education for Science Better." And then here comes Discovery Education pop in. Hey, thanks yes. for the nod. Da, da, da. And like all this happened within yes. 15 minutes while I'm yes. sitting there in a professional development. I'm like. This is what it's about. I mean, yeah. and all, you know, all my colleagues around. It should have been a teachable moment, right? There. I should have stood up and go, "Listen, this just happened." <laughs> and I'm kind of, I guess, I'm kind of pissed that I didn't do that. But, but uh, I hear, yeah, I should have. I hear you. I mean, and you know, and the crazy thing is that you you start to connect with people you're not really connected with, right? So right. I uh, I was walking around school and I, I took a picture of a fifth grade class that was doing something with equivalent fractions or whatever. And all I tweeted was, you know, fifth graders, candy and fifth graders exploring equivalent fractions. So. Within minutes, the teacher, because I tagged her in the tweet, she got tweets from different people or organizations or whatever who who do stuff with equivalent fractions. She had two people email her links to like websites where they have all these online activities, and she was like, "Tony, it totally transformed my whole unit mm -hmm. on equivalent on fractions, right?" That's but amazing. specifically, it was awesome. And 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 she's on Twitter, but she doesn't really get it. And she said, "She's like, I had that moment. I got it. She's like, mm -hmm. I didn't even ask for it, but people were willingly sharing and, and giving uh -huh. me resources. So that's it. That's it in a nutshell. That's like that's what Twitter is about." Definitely. So you also serve as the founder and the co-moderator of NY Ed Chat, and then also the co-moderator of PT Chat. How how do those come about? And I'd like to hear a little. I, I mean, I think I know what most. I think most of us know what the state Ed Chats are, but I want to hear more about PT Chat and what that is. Well, all right, all right. We'll start with PT Chat. I'm, okay. I'm lucky. I'm lucky because I'm riding the coattails of my buddy Joe Mazza, really. So I, I can't <laughs> take any credit for for PT Chat, but that's that's his baby. Um, and basically, it's a parent teacher chat that happens Wednesday nights at nine o'clock. So it's happening in like 15 minutes. And clearly, I'm not going to be able to participate. So Joe, don't be mad at me. But um, <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all your fault. It's Todd's fault. <laughs> uh, we um, I started participating in it. Um, about a year and a half ago, just you know, randomly, and I didn't know Joe. And actually, Joe ended up being a student at Penn as well in the same doctoral program that I was in, except ahead of me um, in the program. And so then we connected in real life, right? And, and that's always great, right? To take that sort of PLN thing from online, and then when you meet that person in real life, it's it's a great thing because you feel like you've known them right forever. Um, and so having participated in a bunch of PT chats, um, Joe. So I was like, listen, would you want to be one of the moderators? And, and it's a great opportunity to have this dialogue with so many constituent groups because you have, obviously, administrators on the chat, you have teachers who are on the chat, but even more importantly, you have parents on the chat and families who are, who are looking to link the community and the school, right, and looking to flatten the walls and really get a sense of what's going on in schools. And it's also an opportunity for us to hear what's important to them. So PT Chat is, like, definitely one of my favorite chats to participate in because there are so many perspectives being presented, and sometimes we even get students on there. Student Voice will participate. Um, Stu Voice, like hashtag, Stu Voice uh, mm -hmm. gets involved as well. So, so then you have everyone really vocalizing. You have superintendents there. So it really is a wonderful, powerful chat, and I learned so much about connecting with the community and interacting with families and and raising the level of engagement. Um, so PT Chat is definitely highly uh, one that I highly recommend. Not just because I'm one of the moderators, because sure. I'm not even that good of a moderator, but um, I, I do think it's a great chat that, that all educators and, and families should participate in. And as a dad, it gives me a different perspective as well, and, and I find myself answering the questions you know, a different way depending on what lens I'm you know, looking through. Um, as for NYH... 9 p.m. Yeah. on Wednesdays, 9 p.m. Eastern? 9 p.m. Eastern, yes. I just assume the whole world is on Eastern Standard Time, so really, why do we talk about anything else? But it is <laughs> Eastern Standard Time. Um, yeah, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then the other one we do is NYA Chat. So, and that kind of started because Tom would be, um, I don't know, I kiddingly sent him a tweet. I was like, dude, what's up? Why don't we have any NYA Chat going on? And so Tom wrote me back. He's like, I don't know. Why don't, why don't we have it? Why don't you start it? I was like, oh shucks, Tom Whitby just called me out on Twitter to start like NY Ed Chat. <laughs> so you can't say no to Tom, right? No. Nope. Uh, so he's gonna come like wrap me up in a Hawaiian shirt or something. So I didn't I did not I, I took that as as a motivation to to 
to just go with it. So um, I actually connected with my friend Bill Brennan, uh, who's active on Twitter, Dr. Bill Brennan on Twitter. He's a great guy. He's local on Long Island as well, an amazing thinker. And we just started talking about it, and he was like, sure, let's do it. So it was kind of organic at first, um, and we did it like once a month. We couldn't manage more than that because we're not the most organized, but that's okay. Um, and then it has evolved. So now we have a bunch of moderators. We have Vicky Day and, and Carol Velasarda and, and uh, Blanca Duarte and Star. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, moderators, which is great, and they have totally enhanced the experience. We've had you know guest speakers on tomorrow night, uh, sorry, Monday night, um, January 27th at 9 p.m. We're doing a joint NYA chat with... Um, Dave Burgess, uh, Teach Like a Pirate. Oh, cool. oh, yes, we love Dave. Very excited. Dave is awesome. Dave yeah. is like, that's it. Anyway, so yeah, so we're doing that. And, and, and these moderators who joined our team this year, they really upped the game because Bill and I were kind of like, yeah, we'll just talk about whatever. But now we have like, you know, Chris Lehman is going to be on in a couple of weeks and oh, cool. an author is going to be on in a couple of months, whatever the case may be. Um, and when we're trying to really make that the, the, the platform for New York educators to connect because... Interestingly enough, as huge as New York is, the state, and as many schools and educators as we have in this state, for whatever reason, it is such a low, minimally represented community on, on Twitter. And so we're trying to build that um, and, and give them a platform to connect and see the, the power in those connections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so we always we, saw, we always hear about how great learners... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I read that <laughs> wrong. <laughs> we always hear about how great learners continue their learning. One way we do that through is, uh, is through reading. So do you have any books that you're currently reading or have read in the past that you'd recommend, maybe education or even, even otherwise? Okay, well, I, I can give you several books because right, I'm in the middle, yeah, I'm in the middle you're of the doctoral doctor program. That's yeah, all I do is read. <laughs> I got books, not much else. I got books. I got no money. <laughs> but, but, no. All right, wait. But first and foremost, for any elementary and middle school person, you must, must read the book Wonder by R.J. Palacios. Yes, okay? yes. That is like a life-changing book. It is like a defining moment, and it is a book that every person must read because in a nutshell, it talks about being kinder than necessary. So we can all be kind, but can we be kinder than necessary? And can we look past that exterior? And not in that very superficial judge a book by its cover kind of way, but the depth um, that is there with people and individuals and getting to know them and valuing them. It is the most amazing book um, I have read in a very long time. So I highly recommend that one. Okay. All right, I'm going to keep it to kids. Can we just keep it to kids' books? For sure. sure. Yeah. To hear about my, no one wants to hear about my doctoral studies. It's not really interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's interesting to me, uh, and I'm paying a lot of money, so I'm going to make it interesting to other people. Now, um, you all have to read the book Fig Pudding by Ralph Fletcher. Fig Pudding is a, is a chapter book. It's one of Ralph's like um, earlier chapter books. Such an amazing story about a family. Um, they have like five or six kids and their journey um, over the course of a year. It's a bit sad. There's a, there's a sad point in the book that is, you know, I feel like with every kid's realistic fiction book, there's some sort of horrible situation that happens. But anyway, um, it is a great, great book. And Ralph Fletcher is on Twitter, so you can connect with him there. I highly, highly recommend, recommend that book. Um, and then the other book that I think is a great book is uh, There's Something About Georgie. Or, oh, sorry, The Thing About Georgie. My, my wife is correcting me. Uh, <laughs> the, thing, the Thing About Georgie by Lisa Graff, I think is her name. Um, very similar to the themes that are presented in Wonder, um, and that book is about a little boy who's um, who's impacted by some sort of developmental issue, and then his family is expecting another baby, and sort of what he has to deal with as he prepares for this, and and what normal will look like if the baby is, you know, quote unquote normal. So um, I highly recommend all three of those books. Must reads for parents, teachers, kids, um, definitely through middle school. Uh, they're game changers. Okay, so have you read Because of Mr. Terrupt? No, I don't know because of this. You need book. to read that one. Okay. That, that and Wonder are the two books that my uh, reading teacher partner gave me to read last year okay. that are at the top of my list of the best books I've read. Because of Mr. Turrupt. T-E-R-U-P-T. Okay, I'm writing it down. I'm not right sure now. who the author is, but my mom's an English teacher too, and I gave it to her. I mean, it, you, it'll make you cry, so be prepared for that. You know. But, um, it's, it's so good. I like a good tearjerker. I'm all about the tearjerkers. Bring it on. I got my Kleenex so. and I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, read it, if you read it, you have to let me know what you think. Okay, I will. That, I, listen, I have a lot of free time between this dissertation and stuff. So <laughs> exactly. I'm going to find time to read. You know what? Okay, wait. I have to say, actually, if there's, if there's a professional book 
that you must read. Okay, I don't mean to backtrack, but I just read this book because I made time to read it. Um, I will openly admit I'm not the biggest fan of reading, just in general, because I have a little ADHD thing going on, and so mm-hmm. if I pick up a book, my mind goes about a million other places. But you have to read the book by Chris Lehman and Kate Roberts about um, loving close reading, which, of course, right now the title is escaping me. Um, but I just read it. Um, an amazing book about close reading. And so with the Common Core and shifts in instruction and all this stuff, which can stress people out, this book is a really wonderful sort of outline for how to uh, how close reading can look in your classroom and what it means for kids and how we can get kids to use a close read to have a deeper understanding of vocabulary and, and text and, and have richer connections and things like that. Highly recommend What's that book. Falling in love with close reading. You got it, Chris. You there are you the go. man. How about that? I got nothing. Google, Google to the rest. <laughs> I can't focus on the title of the book because all I see in the background of my computer is this, and I'm just dying to have some kettle pop. I'll, I'll do it after. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> so um, recently you were recognized by the BAMI Awards uh, for your elementary school principal of the year. Can you tell us a little bit more about that experience? It's completely humbling. Um, not at all deserved. <laughs> So either clearly they just miscounted the votes. I don't know what happened. Anyway, um, it was it was you know so I didn't really know anything about the Mammies until started seeing people tweeting about it. Um, you know I looked into it. I thought it was great. I thought it was great that there was this organization or, or group of educators that existed that was looking to recognize all the awesome things that are happening in education, right? All the awesome teachers and preschool teachers and nurses and administrators and all that stuff. Um, so I actually nominated our library media specialist. Uh, she likes to be called the librarian, but she says that's old school, so I got to say library media. <laughs> uh, I nominated her for that, um, for the BAMI, for that there was a category. So somehow word got out that I nominated her, uh, and, and I, I purposely chose her just because she's phenomenal, and the library is like the hub of everything in our school. But anyway, and we have an amazing staff, and it could have been any teacher, but there was a category. It spoke to me. We nominated her. Somehow, I don't know, some parents found out. I think, I think our... PTA co-president maybe found out, and suddenly I got nominated for, for this thing, right, which was great. It was a great honor. She wrote the nicest thing. And then people were, like, tweeting about it and putting it on Facebook and emailing about it, like, the parents and the whole community. And suddenly people were writing all these, like, ridiculously kind things about me and my leadership and my role as, as, as a principal and the impact that I have on their kids. And it was unreal. I can't even tell you because you do this job that you love, and it does not feel like work. And so the reward is in that. Like it's it's in walking around a building and having a first grader hug you, aka tackle you, uh, and, and in the hallway, and and that's all you need. That's all you want, you know. Or have a conversation with a teacher about instruction and, and think about how it could be enhanced or whatever. Uh, and those things happen for me every day. So in my mind, I was like, ah, this is ridiculous to even get nominated, but it's great. It's an honor. Right. Wonderful. Okay. So now the backstory is that the Bammies, all the emails they were sending me the whole time were going into my spam, so I didn't even know that I was like a finalist for the thing, and um, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize what was going on exactly. I did hear that they announced some sort of, I don't know, the voice, I don't even know what it was, but one person from each category won some sort of voice honor or something, so I did not win that. I just assumed, okay, I'm not winning the award, it doesn't really matter, I'm not interested, it's fine, uh, I'm okay with it. Um, only to finally get contacted by the Bammies because they were like, wait a second, are you coming or not? You're one of our five finalists, you need to come. I was like, okay, so we'll go. I uh, went to Washington, D.C., um, and um, it, it was unreal like to be around all these, like Joe Mazza and, and, and um, Lynn Hilt and um, Chris, uh, whose last name I can't say, Weger, Wedger in, in Canada, um, and someone else was nominated as well, these other principals who I learned so much from, who have impacted my thinking, um, not to mention all the secondary principals like Jimmy Cassis and Eric Scheninger who were also nominated and Chris Lehman, all these amazing people were there. Pernil was there and Daisy and, 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 and Jeff Zuhl and Tom, I mean it was crazy, Adam Bello, I, I mean Amanda Dykes, all these people, I was like in awe, I was in line at this place and all I cared about was seeing all these people. Anyway, well, we get inside and one of the first awards they give out was elementary school principal. And as we're waiting for them to announce the winner, I have about 14 mints in my hand because I, I want a mint, and they fell out of the little package. Instead of just getting one, I have like 14. And then they announce my name, and I'm like, holy crap, I have all these mints in my hand. So what I do, I squeeze my hand shut, 
they melted and stuck to the inside of my hand, but I got up there. <laughs> and oh, I, I picked up the award. It was great. It was good times. The award weighs a lot more than you think it does. Um, <laughs> and it was it was just it was really surreal. I can't even tell you. It, 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 I am beyond humbled and honored to even be in this group of people, right? To be recognized by these people, um, and then to actually be honored in that way. Um, it was great. I gave a horrible acceptance speech or whatever. I don't even know what I said. It was not nice. I didn't thank my family. I didn't thank anyone. Um, but but it was a really wonderful experience in the end. So award aside, to get to hang out with like Tom Murray, um, like I said, and Joe Mazza and Eric, and, 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 and to spend time just talking to them. Erin Klein. I mean, Erin Klein is amazing. She's like this. Love Erin Klein. Oh, my God. Yeah. Joan Young. Like, uh, what's her name? Joyce Valencia. All these people were there, and, and all I did was talk to these people and learn. I mean, and I'm talking about in the lobby of the hotel, having a conversation with Aaron Klein and Joan Young about mindful thinking and kids and instruction and whatever. And where were we? I mean, they were jogging. I mean, I was not jogging, but they came in from some sort of walk or whatever, you know. And it was it was a game changer for me. Like it really, yeah. it was an amazing experience. I, I think the cool thing I can, I can probably speak for them too. The, the cool thing is they're probably thinking the exact same thing when they're there too. Uh -huh. they're, they they don't deserve to be there and, and yada yada. And I get to hang out with all these cool people. I I would imagine that they all feel the exact same way. It's really yeah. it's a, that's what's cool about it. it. It's it's crazy. You know, like you meet Aaron Klein. I felt like I was meeting like Madonna. You know, <laughs> it was like, or you know, you, Pernil. Pernil was like a giant and could step on me if she wanted to. You know, but she was this this great person. And you just talk to these people who you know and 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 you know how they think, right? Because on Twitter we share for the most part we're pretty transparent about our thinking and our our, our love for instruction and education and whatever. But then you get to talk to them in real life, and it, it just it goes to a whole other level. And so for me, the Bammies was about that. Um, the Bammy Award is beautiful. It sits on my table at work. It's lovely. Um, but the experience was, for me, wow. It was just awesome. Cool. Well, you know, talking about building relationships and connecting with people, um, as an administrator and even as a teacher, you know you connect with a lot of adults and students throughout your career. Can you think of a particular interaction that you've had with maybe a student or a family or a parent that is just going to stick with you for a lifetime? Oh, oh now that's a, that's a big question, Todd. <laughs> 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 I've been doing this for like 17 years, and a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, oh my gosh! I, you know what? I, I don't know that I could pick just one. I don't know. First of all, I could tell you that I, I, I honestly and genuinely believe that most of my students now at Kanyag and the ones that I taught when I was a teacher think that they're my favorite. All my kids, and they really are, right? You know, I mean, you connect with different kids in different ways. So, not that anyone's your favorite, but you might have a different type of connection with with certain kids. So. Um, all right, so I'll tell you about one kid. I had Alex, uh, I won't say his last name, but I had Alex when he was in fifth grade, and Alex um, lost his dad on 9-11, and so I started tutoring Alex after school, um, I don't know, once or twice a week or whatever it was, and I watched this little kid, you know, because he was this little kid. He was 10, 11 years old, and he lost his dad. And he like immediately had to grow up and, and, and be mature and be thoughtful and, 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 and think about his mom and you know things that most 11 year olds don't have to worry about. Um, and he did it in such a mature way. I would go tutor him, but I can tell you that I learned more about life from watching this little boy than anything else. Um, I don't know what he learned from me. I don't, I don't know, but we'll go with it because we mm -hmm. He graduated from high school and he's in law school now, so something must have happened correctly along the way. Uh, <laughs> but um, that was a game changer for me to, to be a part of this kid's life from the time he was like 10 or 11 and to still be a part of his life. We're friends on Facebook. We text. I had dinner with him you know, a while back. Um, he, he just taught me. He gave me perspective, right? And so everything can be great one day and then it just all changes. And how do you respond to that and how do you function after that? Um, that's what life is about, and so I learned that from Alex, along with a lot of other kids who taught me so right. much about, about what matters. So yeah, that that's that's one, and that's a family I stay in touch with, and um, and that that are very close and dear to my heart. Cool. If you could go back five or ten years and give yourself some advice, what kind of what kind of advice would you tell yourself? <laughs> it is a marathon, not a race. So <laughs> don't sprint. Right? Is that the phrase? I don't know, but like, yeah. um, and. And um, and balance. Balance is really important because um, you can easily throw yourself into this thing, you know. When, and I think I, I think educators, for the most part, aside from the ones who give us a bad name, and I don't think there are many of those, but they are there. Most of us lead 
with our heart, right? That's why we do this. I don't mean just lead as is is a principle, but even in your classroom, and 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 oftentimes we think with our heart before we even think with our head because we're impacting kids, right? We're we're shaping kids and their thinking, and we're trying to model for them. Um, so for me, going back and and just reminding myself to maintain balance and and to take care of myself and to to maintain hobbies and interests of my own, so that you could have that place to escape to because this job is very and it's not a job because it's a life right it's 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 emotionally exhausting in amazing ways but also in really challenging ways and so you need that balance to to kind of maintain the energy and the enthusiasm that's needed to be I feel like a, a successful educator right well you know if someone were just were to describe you and use only three words what are three words you would hope that they would use when describing you uh -huh. <laughs> That I hope that they would use. <laughs> okay, um, hope that they would use. All right, stunningly good looking. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Your I wife hope... is rolling. I can hear your wife rolling her eyes in the back. She actually left the room about four minutes ago. <laughs> she was like, "I'm done. I don't want your resident. Especially when I said balance, because I have none. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so all right. I, I would say that I hope. Um, I hope people would describe me as compassionate. Um, I hope that people would describe me as uh, as thoughtful. I try to be thoughtful about what I do and say and, and the people around me. Um, and I hope that people, I don't know, this is not a word, but although I take my job really seriously, I don't take myself really seriously. And so laughter is a big part of, of my day, um, of my work. I incorporate it into faculty meetings. I incorporate it into PTA meetings. I will often have people tell me, have you thought about doing a stand-up gig? So, I, so I, maybe funny, maybe we'll go with funny, but it, it's, it's more go. about that sort of self-effacing, like, right. yeah, right, my job is important, but I'm not that important, because anyone could do my job, but it's how well I could do it that matters. And so, so those three things, I think, would, I don't know, I would, I would hope. And skinny, hello, skinny. <laughs> <laughs> and super tall, right? Super tall and skinny, yeah, hello. Uh, and next year, I'm going to win the BAMI for best looking administrator. No, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, th those are, those are three qualities that I try to espouse, and, and my dad definitely imparted on me. I feel like um, pretty pretty consistently. That's great. Well, is there a moment in your career when you kind of look back um, and think, and it's something that you're really proud of accomplishing? Oh, there are many, and 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 honestly, very few of them are associated with me. Uh, that I don't, I, that I don't even associate with myself. Like I wouldn't even, um, I wouldn't. The Bammies, being at the Bammies, would be at the top of my list, but because of the people that were there. But right. I think I think about our school. Um, so I think about two things. So one is when we won the blue ribbon, um, and that's a great honor. But the process before that was really powerful because I don't know if either of you have ever participated in the Blue Ribbon like application process, but you have to write like 20 essays. Um, and typically, from what I hear from other administrators, it's like two or three people, like usually the principal and a helper or assistant principal, whatever. They get together, they spend days and weeks writing these essays, and it's a you know pretty laborious process. We as a staff, and we were at a faculty meeting, and I was like, listen, we got nominated for Blue Ribbon. I don't really have that much time, so I can't write these essays. So they are all here on big chart paper. Do you guys want to do this? Do we want to apply for the Blue Ribbon? Can we do this together? And within minutes, our staff split up into little teams and groups. They each took a question, and over the course of like two weeks, they got together on their lunch. They came in early. They stayed late. They wrote these amazing essays about our school because the questions were about you know reading instruction and math instruction and, and the content areas and, and, and me as a leader and our community and so on and so forth. And they... Their voice, their voice told that story, and it was awesome. It was so awesome to read these pieces that I didn't have to write. Well, I didn't have to write them, which was great. Uh, talk about delegating, but no. <laughs> um, but it was wonderful to hear that this group of like 70 people, who in the end, it's, that's about how many participated, came out with such common themes and strands that ran between all these pieces. It was, it was awesome. So that was definitely one. The other one would probably be when, when our main office, so in our main office we have two secretaries. Um, in my second year there, one of our secretaries passed away after a really long battle with ovarian cancer. Um, I don't know if any of you, you know, have experienced that, but that is like a game changer. It can be a game changer for a building. Like it can impact the tone, the culture, the morale, you name it, especially when it's a person that everyone respected and, and, and loved, and they did. Yeah. Phyllis, you know. But when Phyllis passed away, the thing that blew me away was how our community came together, came together for her family, came together for each other. The day that the funeral happened, 
uh, you know, was a day that it was a school day, so we had to figure out coverage, and it was not even an issue. Teachers came from other buildings uh, to cover, to teach. I mean, it was unbelievable to watch um, and to see the way our community uh, not only connected, but but solidify this connection um, that has sustained us for years. And and so from something so negative and painful came something so incredibly positive. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So, uh, last question we'd like to kind of in in note on is, uh, what are you really passionate about right now in education? Uh, state testing and high stakes common core. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like good answer. Come on, I like us too. <laughs> we love it too. Don't you love it? I want to reduce every teacher to a number on her or his evaluation. I love that. My favorite thing. I love to torture kids for six days of state testing every year. Third, <laughs> my favorite days. Those are my. Favorite. No, um, <laughs> uh, I think what am I most passionate about? I'm most passionate about right now about telling our story, and so this whole branding thing has you know come into my my space, and I learned a lot about it from Eric. Shen, Eric is like the man, right? I mentioned his name like yeah. 15 times already, but yes, okay. So I've learned a lot from Eric um, Scheninger, and he he's all about branding, right? So I connected with Joe Sanfilippo, who is um, a superintendent in Wisconsin. Uh, through Twitter, we connected, and somehow we both ended up at Ed Camp, New Jersey. And because he came out east for a visit or whatever, and we did this thing together about branding and telling our story, and it has blossomed into something great. Like we have this great connection. We're always sharing. We're blogging about it. We do a weekly or biweekly podcast on on the Bam Network, um, and 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 now there's possibly a book. I don't know. Whatever. We're, we're very early stages in a conversation about that, um, and this whole idea of telling our story because we as educators, right? We know what's happening in our schools, and there are so many amazing things happening in our schools. So why let other people tell the world what's happening? Why let the local paper, you know, because in New York we have local papers that write that we make too much money, we have too much time off, that you know our kids are struggling, we're we're behind the gap, and everyone, every country in the world except you know us <laughs> is making progress. But but that's not true. Like that's not actually what's going on. And we know what's happening in our schools, and so it is our responsibility. It's it's incumbent upon us to tell our story, to spotlight our kids, spotlight our staff, spotlight our community. Um, and so for me, I have thrown myself into that 100% and I, I live it. All day I tweet about what's happening in school. I tweet pictures and captions of our kids and our staff, what they're doing, but not just what they're doing, how we're doing it and why we're doing it. Um, we, we, I send a link out every week with uh, through Storify that curates all the tweets. Uh, we do a weekly video update with our kids. Um, they tell the story like who better to hear than a second grader telling you what they're learning in school and how excited they are to be there, you know? Um, so for me that is something that I'm really passionate about and I feel like it's an opportunity that every educator sh should and could take advantage of. Like you tell us what's going on in your classroom, you tell us what's going on in your school and be proud of it because there are awesome things happening um, and it has transformed our community. Like I have conversations with parents now about about book clubs and about writers workshop and about one-to-one -one conferencing because they see it, they know what it is. So we're not just talking about bake sales and um, and the bus. Gosh, the bus. There's always problems on the bus, right? But we don't even talk about that anymore because we're talking about these important opportunities for learning. So I'm all about that. Um, telling your story. That's where my my heart is right now. Yeah, good for you. That's that's awesome. Man. What a fantastic answer. I'm very lucky. Well, Tony, you know, we want to thank you so much for coming on with us today. You have been on our list for a while, and I'm glad we were able to get get a hold of you and get you on here. It has been great hearing you share and getting to learn a little bit more about, more about you. So thank you so much. Are you kidding me? Thank you, guys. I love watching your show. I love listening to the people talk about their passions and their interests. The format is awesome. So thank you very much for inviting me. I, 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 don't, I don't belong in the, in the, in the, in the crowd yes. that's been on already. Yes, you do. Yes, but you I, do. But I know that John Fritzke probably threatened you, so I'm good. I'm glad you put me on. <laughs> yeah, John Fritzke was all over me, but, but that's okay. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, guys. Keep doing what you're doing because your enthusiasm is not just here, like watching you, but even through your tweets, it's, it's inspiring. And it's great to know that people like you are impacting kids every single day. So keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, Tony. Thank well, you. for those of you that are listening, we want to remind you, you can connect with us on Twitter at eduallstarshq. Um, our website is eduallstars.com, and you can find us on iTunes by searching eduallstars with no spaces. And then next Wednesday, January 29th, we'll be live with John Samuelson, also known as iPad Sammy, at 8 o'clock Central. Stay tuned for that. I'm sure he's planning to uh, sink the boat. And so it will speak. be an so, interesting show. It will be for interesting sure. for sure. Uh, yeah, I think he's already scheming something up yes. for us. So. You, better, you better watch him. He's trouble. 
Yeah, yeah. And we also encourage you to subscribe to, uh, via iTunes. Leave a rating and some feedback if you like the show, and re we would really appreciate that. And uh, take care. Thanks again, Tony, and we will see everybody next week. Thank you, guys.